thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be at the Tommy Flowers Conference and a great honor to be in a uh, event sponsored by uh, the quantum communication uh, area, um, and BT in particular. Um, so um, and I'll try to like say a few words about like what quantum sensors might have to do with communications and uh, that industry in general. Um, so hopefully like some people will also look at the surroundings of like besides what you can do with the quantum computing and the comms, uh, what else do you need to like make it all happen or um, what else can you do to improve things? Um, so the quantum Sensors, um, hub in uh, sensors and timing uh, is one of the four quantum technology hubs uh, funded by uh, UKI and EPSSC. Um, so you've heard about the comms hub uh, led by York. Tim Spiller is there. There's the computing hub in Oxford, uh, the uh, imaging hub in uh, Glasgow. The sensing hub is led by the University of Birmingham, collaboration with the universities of Glasgow, Imperial College London, Nottingham, Southampton, Strathclyde, and Sussex. And we work with British Geological Survey and NPL. Um, so why sensors? Um, and in principle, if you look around the devices you encounter every day, like power stations, transport, agriculture, and the Internet of, Internet of Things, sensors are inside everything. We often don't notice them, but particularly the Internet of Things, you wouldn't have much to connect there if there wasn't a sensor telling you something, like what's the temperature in your house, um, what's the filling status of your fridge, or like whatever status. So these, all these items usually have very cheap sensors, and lots of them, and a lot of processing, and a lot of um, effort goes into AI, machine learning, um, and clever methods of get quality information out of these sensors. Uh, quantum sensors, on the other hand, go more around the way of saying, what if we change the quality of information or the quality of data coming from the sensor into something which is completely novel, sensing something which was previously unsensible. Um, so, and just looking back at Nobel prizes, um, 1901, that was the Nobel Prize in X-rays, and at that time, no one knew what this funny radiation was. Nowadays, it's in every hospital, in every airport scanner, in industrial uh, you know, uh, quality control systems. Uh, so it really changed how we live, how we operate, uh, how we do business. A lot of sensors go into medical um, applications, like the electron microscope, MRI, um, Scanners, but there are also some are uh, like the aperture synthesis uh, for radio astronomy, uh, which was a Nobel Prize in the I think 50s or 60s, which became the foundation of synthetic aperture radar, which is now uh, nowadays controlling our entire airspace. So flight and airports and all that would not really be the same without like these novel sensors being able to see into the sky with high precision. Giant magnetic resistance was the Nobel Prize in the 80s, was the foundation of what the high density hard drives are, where we get into like information which needs to be communicated, but to store it, you need that sensor which sends magnetic fields at a very tiny space. And of course, what maybe most of you are most familiar with is a CCD sensor, Nobel Prize in the 2000s, uh, quite recently, uh, developed in the 1969, uh, but this really, like it was developed for astronomy, but nowadays the entire selfie industry, the entire social media, it would be, I wouldn't be speaking to you on uh, this video conference if I didn't have my CCD sensor in my uh, laptop. So it really changed how we operate and was disruptive to a lot of industries. So quantum sensors now, instead of doing like these serendipitous steps of uh, like having a sensor innovation and taking decades to go into, um, into some commercial products, our aim is really to get potential offered by quantum sensing into markets quite quickly. And there are at least four like completely novel sensing modalities offered. One is seeing into the ground. So seeing what's beneath our feet, sensing like, okay, the infrastructure, which is buried, um, water, oil, minerals, uh, and just the risk in infrastructure projects is about half a percent of GDP. And of course, if you want broadband fiber coming to your house, you have 30 million homes where you have to dig up the road and put a cable in, and you want to know if there's a gas pipe or electrical line in the way, um, so which is 
otherwise a lot of digging, careful digging. Um, sensors which look at the function in the brain um, with applications in dementia uh, or general brain health, and I talk about that a bit more uh, later, uh, then sensing small objects in the air. This is really the timing driving radar systems forward, uh, precision oscillators, and Mark already spoke about them, um, driving the noise in a radar system down, enabling networked radar systems by coherent uh, microwave emission and uh, transmission over distances uh, will help to allow us to do urban flight, like flying taxis, uh, packet delivery drones. We want these to be safe and we want these to be monitored in cities, and you need a very, very good sensing technology for that, uh, where I think quantum can play a role. But saying that, actually, starting to uh, network radar systems, make them coherent, uh, that's microwaves, coherent, emitted, and uh, received somewhere. So that starts to sound a bit like uh, mobile phones, mobile phone masks. What can you do there if you had coherence like very, very precise timing, a thousand times more precise than you have currently in the networks. If you could make this whole communication system coherent, what can you do with that? We need researchers and people and engineers to think about what can we actually do with these new possibilities? What is that opening up? What kind of disruptive abilities? Um, and yeah. On the other hand, like I wouldn't be talking to you if BT hadn't had uh, very ingenious um, engineers thinking about how to um, put together the like different waves on copper cables uh, to uh, like signal process out all the disturbances so that actually I can get 20 megabit per second into my house even on a very old copper cable. Um, so that technology can we use that possibly to have network radar systems to improve the resolution. So I think there's a lot of technology transfer here as well, which we can think about. And the last thing is sensors which are enabling you to sense your position and movement very precisely. And you might say, oh, we all have that with satellite uh, navigation, uh, like my smartphone tells me exactly where I am. But of course, um, these are becoming more and more vulnerable uh, because the satellite signals are very weak. You can buy jammers easily. And even for five pounds, you can buy devices which allow you to spoof the signal. So uh, like, yeah, okay, uh, you might just want to play a harmless game of Pokemon Go and like, make yourself appear in all kinds of places without leaving your living room. Uh, but this might have very severe impacts on uh, the resilience of our economy because a lot of transport, a lot of uh, critical infrastructure relies on those. So what are the ingredients? Uh, of the quantum sensors. We are actually not working with photons. We're using light, uh, but we're using light to create our probe particles and our quantum particles atoms. We use two ingredients um, based on like Nobel Prize physics. Nobel Prize physics uh, in 1997 for laser cooling and in 2001 for even further cooling to really get atoms uh, under perfect quantum control, really get them down to the wave function that we know to Heisenberg's uncertainty limit where they are and how fast they move. So preparing our atoms is very important so that we can observe them very precisely afterwards. Uh, and then we have to manipulate them. And again, we use lasers for that. Um, and um, that was the Nobel Prize in 2012. How do you uh, manipulate single quantum systems so that you can put them in quantum superposition state in a controlled way uh, and use these superposition features to do very precise measurements. That is something actually which the quantum computing people, they use the superposition states and try to shield all the external uh, influences so that you can compute with them. And they are, these states are very, very sensitive. So they have to work very hard in shielding them. In sensors, we use that vice as a virtue uh, to like, use the extreme sensitivity of these states to do very precise measurements. So now, oops, that was enlarging it. I didn't want that, sorry. Um, let's have a look at how this works. Um, so laser cooling, at least, can be explained with a very few um, simple uh, mechanisms. First of all, you have to realize photons have a momentum and transferred to the atom upon excitation. So when a f an atom uh, absorbs a photon, so the photon, the wiggly line, the atom, this one, and the electron moves up uh, an energy state, the atom also starts to move because it takes the momentum of the photon. 
the particle of light, and the momentum change you get, the velocity change is about the same as you, if you had an elephant on a roller skate hit by a tennis ball. It's six millimeters per second, and if you could have the video, please. So that's not very much, um, but if you accumulate this, uh, then uh, you actually can accelerate the elephant to a significant speed. Uh, so if you use the tennis ball cannon, the elephant would actually start to move quite a lot, and you can accumulate speed after a while. Atoms can scatter photons at 10 million photons per second. So could we please get back to the um, slideshow? Um, 10 million photons per second allows us to accelerate strong 10,000 times faster than a Formula One car. So you can Extre exert extreme accelerations for the atoms. The second ingredient you need is that atoms can absorb photons only in resonance lines. You might have seen the orange street lights, which is the resonance, resonance line of sodium atoms. You see the same orange light if you put sodium salt in your gas burner. So atoms will absorb photons on their right wavelengths, uh, right frequency, but uh, not very much far away from that. Um, and then the Doppler effect. So if you go to a Formula One race and a car comes towards you, you hear higher frequency due to compression of the sound wave than when it moves away from you, uh, where like the sound waves get elongated. Same ha happens for atoms moving towards light or away from light. So if you put this together and you take laser beams coming from two sides, shining on an atom, uh, and the resonance of the laser indicated by uh, the red arrow here is a bit less than resonance of the atoms. So the frequency is less to hit the resonance frequency of the atoms. Um, so they scatter photons, but not as many as if they were on resonance. So if this atom now moves to the right, the laser coming from the right will be Doppler shifted to a higher frequency, which is closer to resonance, and scatter more photons. While the laser coming from the left, as the atom moves away from that, is shifted to a lower frequency, as seen by the atom, and scatters less photons. So the atom scatters more photons from the laser opposing its motion, which means the momentum uh, of the photons will slow it down. If the atom moves to the left, actually the laser from the left gets close to the resonance, scatters more photons, slows the atom down. So if we place six lasers around the atom from all directions, then uh, wherever the atom wants to move, it gets slowed down by the laser, which gets shifted closer to resonance by the Doppler effect. If you had these ideas about 40 years ago, you would have won a Nobel Prize. So physics can sometimes be simple, but this really changed the world because we were able to control atoms very precisely. You add a few uh, like magnetic field coils, uh, and yet then you can also trap them in space. And you don't need any uh, like cryostat or liquid helium for this. They, they go to temperatures of microkelvin, a millions above absolute zero. Uh, but as it's atoms and they don't see black body radiation, a vacuum chamber is enough to isolate them from the environment. This little dot here in the center is a cloud of about 100 million sodium atoms at a few microkelvin. So once you have that, you use uh, laser pulses again uh, to like put the atoms in superposition states. I'm not going to go into detail here, but uh, in principle you can use the laser cooling at the start to launch your atoms, now depicted as matter waves. You have a laser coming, a laser pulse, which flashes onto the atom. It's resonant with the transition, and we only leave it on for about a time that it has a 50% probability of exciting the atom. In classical terms, 50% is, okay, you get half of them excited, half not excited. In quantum terms, what happens is the atoms end up in a quantum superposition of being excited and not excited at the same time. The no, uh, non-excited part just flies up on a falling trajectory as you would expect on a falling parabola. The excited part has also taken a photo momentum, so it moves a bit lower. So they also separate in space. So this is not two atoms, it's one atom being up here and down here at the same time in two different internal states. Now as they are at different places at the same time, we can't really do much with those. We have to flip uh, the states uh, with another laser pass, which is 100% photon exchange probability. So the ground state goes to the excited state, takes a photon, the excited to the ground state leaves the photon, and they start moving back together. And then you do a last laser pass with 50% probability, so they mix the states, and you end up uh, detecting uh, just how many atoms are in the excited, how many in the ground state, to detect the relative phase between these two pathways, which if they are split in gravity, 
um, along the gravity direction gives you a very precise measurement of gravity. You can get similar measurements if you enclose an area for rotation or if you just do the internal states for time or for magnetic fields. So can we have that video, please? Just to say, okay, it all sounds very quantum, maybe a bit spooky, uh, but it's real engineering here. We have hardware, we have a vacuum chamber made out of metal, uh, we have an atomic oven, um, we have lasers, we have electronics to drive the lasers, and that is more or less everything you need. So you create the atoms from an oven, attach the vacuum chamber, you create a flux, a cloud of atoms which move down into a, a very good vacuum where you have these six laser beams uh, intersecting uh, to cool them. By detuning the upper and lower laser beams, you can throw them up, and while they're flying, you do these three laser paths. The first one splitting the atomic states into like excited and not excited. The next one, like making the trajectories uh, move together again, and the last one mixing them and reading them out. So can you go back to the uh, presentation, please? So I go quickly uh, with the uh, next slides. Uh, so the physics behind this is actually also very simple because if you do the math, and uh, yeah, you can ask me about that later, uh, effectively it turns out what you're measuring, uh, the phase between these two trajectories, is just how far the atoms dropped, delta z, as a, uh, as a function of measured by the wa laser wavelengths of the laser. So you measure how far do the atoms drop as compared to a laser ruler. So very much like Newton measuring an apple falling next to a ruler. So that's like really quite classical, but really a quantum measurement in this case. Fortunately, these two coincide. And if you do these instruments, try to engineer them so that they can measure outside. And this is really, this was developed 25 years ago in the lab. Now it's time to get them out and really do something useful in the field. So here are some instruments we have been doing uh, to measure gravity outside the lab, getting them onto a drone um, and make them like practical for use. And we really need more people who like, take these on perfectionize these instruments, but also look at the applications. Because once you have such an instrument which looks for gravity, you can start looking at underground infrastructure, like the uh, broadband uh, distribution, but also uh, under railways, uh, avoiding landslides, uh, looking for climate like underground water, looking for oil and minerals, or doing navigation by matching uh, like a gravity trace you uh, do while moving uh, to a gravity map so that you get absolute position uh, with gravity. Um, let me do another application example, the healthcare one, because that's a different sensor and a quite a different application, seeing the brain function. So what can we do there? Um, and the sensor is much simpler. We don't need cold atoms. We just have laser light, which is polarized, going through a little vacuum cell, uh, a, a little cell with rubidium vapor or cesium vapor in it. And uh, this is done by our partners in Strasbourg University. Going through the atoms, the uh, laser light changes polarization, and the atom spin, uh, which is like doing this change, depends on the external magnetic field. So the polarization change of the laser uh, depends on the external magnetic field, and you can do very, very sensitive magnetometers with that. Um, and you can do that for oil and mineral, but also they become sensitive enough to see the brain thinking. So brain thinking is neurons firing signals, and in an oscillatory manner, neurons firing, firing electrical signals, uh, which means uh, electrical currents associated with a magnetic field which you pick up with these sensors. Uh, this is like one of the early, early sensor heads. An important thing is with the quantum sensors, you can make sensor heads which you can adapt. Uh, so this is just a signature when you um, uh, essentially excite alpha waves. Uh, so these happen at a bit above 10 hertz. Uh, and uh, here you can see like less activity is blue and more activity is, is bright. And you excite that by just stroking your hand. Um, and uh, you can follow that uh, in like different age groups. Uh, so you can adapt the sensors to different head sizes, follow how brain develops over uh, with age. Um, you can combine these with virtual re reality environments uh, to put people for brain health diagnostics into some more realistic environment. But if you are like the people who want to do the engineering around this and uh, look at the applications, 
You might think brain-machine interfaces. Can you actually steer a computer game with this? Can you steer machines with that? I think the possibilities are endless, and there will be a lot of, maybe you can communicate your feelings uh, via like such helmets at some point in the future. Um, it works concurrent with EEG and better than EEG, um, so uh, at least in terms of external uh, signal, and you don't need contact to the head, so it's uh, like much lower barrier to use these helmets. Um, and as I said, they're variable. You can look at the brain while you're playing an instrument. They're adaptable to different sizes. The data is much better. You get a better signal-to-noise ratio than existing MEG systems. And they're also cheaper. Uh, this is now going into spin-off, uh, but I think the applications, we're just at the, uh, like at the beginning of that. So a lot of work needed here. With that, I'm going to finish. Um, and I just say, uh, like, the hub is following a journey where we have identified some applications of these sensors, uh, like uh, communications, uh, like clocks for communications, but also for radar systems, um, gravity sensors for geophysics, but also oil and minerals and navigation and the infrastructure work, uh, the magnetic sensors mainly for brain, but maybe at some point animal health. Um, and inertial sensing for navigation. And, of course, we want to make this smaller from lab-based experiments to drones to, at some point, handheld. So if any of you is interested in like, either developing these sensors, moving that forward, or want to work on the application side, we'd be really pleased to talk to you about that. Thank you.